Good morning. Welcome. Come on in, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Welcome to Stevens Valley Church. We are thankful that you're here with us this morning for worship and pray that God will be glorified and you will be blessed and edified for your having been here. Um, if you have a, a cell phone, and I know most of you will, would you, or any other electronic devices, would you please silence those now as uh, we will take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's stand together and worship the living God as we sing hymn number 45. 45.
Let us pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You have ransomed us, healed us, restored us, forgiven us. Lord, you know our weak frames and you deal with us gently. You promise that you will not break the bruised reed or quench the faintly burning wick. You dwell in the high and holy place, but also with those who have contrite hearts and lowly spirits. Take our broken hearts and make them whole. Take our lowly spirits and lift them up in the sure and certain hope that Jesus Christ is our Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. And receive our praise as we say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our New Testament lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We will read 2 Corinthians 7. Verses 5 through 10. For even when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for for me, so that I rejoiced still the more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you'll take your bulletin in hand, you'll find now in our order of worship a corporate confession, general confession of sin. We'll use these words to confess aloud and after that we'll have a few moments of silence where we can individually confess our sins let us pray gracious lord we humbly seek your forgiveness of our many sins we regret that we too often done what is right in our own eyes we are sorry for the times we have lightly regarded our sin and profaned your holiness have mercy upon us Grant us deep repentance that we may mourn our sins and hereafter earnestly endeavor to do your will and live according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us sinners, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the passage that we read a few moments ago 
the Apostle Paul describes a situation in his life in which he was, as he put it, downcast. He was laid low, uh, fighting within, fighting without, you know, in a situation of turmoil. And then his friend Titus came to visit him, and he said, Titus lifted up this downcast sinner. And, and Titus had been lifted up by the Corinthians, and so that lifted up Paul all, all the more. And that's really the job of the church, when you think about it, is that we are all go through our periods of being down, and we come together and we lift one another up. And the main thing that we lift people up with, we lift one another up with, is the good news of the gospel. The Puritan author William Bridge wrote a book in the 1600s called Lifting Up for the Downcast. It was based on Psalm 42, which the psalmist says to himself, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I will yet find my redemption. And a bridge in that book, one of the classic quotes, he says, God has provided promises of comfort, support, and relief suitable to all conditions. I dare boldly challenge all men to show me any one condition which God has not provided a promise of comfort, mercy, and relief suitable to it. He said, I dare you to show me somebody who's too far gone for God's grace. I dare you to show me somebody who's too far down that God can't lift them up. Lift them up. I don't think anybody's taken him up on that dare in 400 years. And he's long gone now. And I don't plan on taking him up on it today. The downcast Paul was lifted up by the coming of Titus with good news. And we come to this place with good news today. Jesus Christ, in his death, was cast down so that you could be lifted up. He left his father, father's throne so that you could have a home before his father's throne. He was forsaken so that you could be accepted and forgiven. He took the judgment your sins deserve so that you could have the favor that only he deserved. And so I ask you this, what the psalmist asked himself, why are you cast down? Why is your soul in turmoil within you? Hope in God for you have found salvation and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you receive it, then let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. And uh, one of the things that uh, encourages all of us, I think, is to see the Lord uh, bringing new people to our congregation. And I know it thrills me personally just to see people stand up publicly and profess their love for the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for his people, the church, and their loyalty to both. And it's sort of icing on the cake that they become new members, uh, but it's so good to see God working in people's hearts and drawing them to our church. So this morning, uh, I'm pleased to introduce the following people to you. I'd love to tell you their stories, but we'd be here all day. So I'm just gonna call their names out. David and Carly Carter. Just come up here and stand on these uh, steps, if you would. David and Carly have a son named Clark, mid-20s or so. Cynthia Collins. Brian and Cloakie Dixon. And Cloakie's mother, Nina Margaret Freeman. Some of these have been around for a while. Some, I won't say who, <laughs> some are brand new, but uh, we're glad to have all of them. Uh, let's see, Susie Garner. Maybe I'll scoot down a little bit. We'll just, everybody seems to be coming up on this side. Bart and Brittany Pride. Bart and Brittany have a uh, son and a daughter, daughter going into middle school and a Son in elementary school. She goes that way, you go this way. <clears throat> Y'all on the same page? <laughs> Never. Never. Yeah. Well, uh, Bart, maybe you stand at that end. She'll stand at this end. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. John and Martha Woods. If y'all would stand on that end, it'd be great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Rima Ziotti. Rima's got a little baby named Isabella that's going to be baptized next week, so that should be very exciting. And last but certainly not least, uh, not 
Okay, Lisiati's going to stand with her. Very good. Uh, Jack and Lisa Monaco. Monaco's here. Uh, they're not printed. Their names aren't in your bulletin because they actually joined with the previous class, but were out of town when the class took their vows. So they're here today. Glad to come stand before you. Let me welcome all of you. We're thrilled to have you. Praise God that they, we need you. <laughs> We're glad he, uh, he brought you to us. And uh, as Heath just said a moment ago, we look forward to uh, upholding each other and encouraging each other and stimulating each other to love and good deeds for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. I will now ask the vows of membership. And as each time we do this, I remind you, if you're a member of this church, these are the same vows uh, that you took. So it's a good time to examine yourself and ask, am I fulfilling the vows that I've made before the Lord? And I will ask these questions to you, and I'll ask you to respond with, I do. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy, do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Do you resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becometh the followers of Christ, do you? Do you, promise, do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? Do you respect the government and discipline of the church and promise to promote its purity and peace, do you? Let's all stand and all profess our faith together as we use the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pray with, <clears throat> pray with me and then we'll sing our next hymn. Father God, we do thank you so much for building your church and for building this one. And we recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing. So we thank you for bringing to us people with uh, gifts and interests, people that want to be here. And uh, uh, we're so thankful that you have uh, provided for us. And Lord, may we uh, bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. May we love each other. Uh, care for each other, pray for uh, each other, know each other, uh, support and, and take an interest in uh, one another. Use us uh, corporately, uh, Lord, as the body of Christ to glorify you, to serve you, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ here in Stevens Valley and Temple Hills and Bellevue and Nashville and even to the uttermost uh, parts of the earth. So uh, bless those among us today that uh, uh, are suffering, that are unable to be here. We think of Tina Gilchrist and pray for your great mercies to be upon her and Rob Michaels undergoing surgery this morning. <clears throat> Grant Rob healing and uh, sustain him, uh, we pray, along with Landy Campbell and uh, uh, Howard Salyer, Cheryl Stinnett recovering from her surgery. Uh, bless these and others and uh, thank you for the health that we enjoy. Uh, we know our lives are short, just a mist uh, here for a while and then gone. So may we be good stewards of every breath you give us. And uh, may we lift high the cross and, and survey the wondrous cross and take our stand beneath the cross and uh, glorify you uh, in all that we do and say. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amen. Please be seated. New hymn I don't think we've sung before. Any of you sung that one before? And a few of you. Well, we did pretty well with it. I hope you liked it. Ukraine has been getting a lot of attention in uh, recent days. As a matter of fact, today is the last day for our Ukraine offering, special offering. There are plates at the information desk. But uh, the country of Lebanon has also been on our hearts uh, for quite some time. And I uh, hope you know this, but you may not. But our church has been heavily involved in Lebanon financially and otherwise supporting Middle Eastern Bible outreach for a number of years and more recently working through Lisiati in a local church there to provide in particular for some uh, severe economic hardships that the people have been uh, uh, experiencing there. And so this morning, <clears throat> I think we're gonna have a, a video again, two weeks in a row, how about that? Uh, as uh, you hear from some of the people in Lebanon and then afterward Lisiati will come and, uh, and bring a report, a verbal report to us. Good morning. Well, you heard. It's really sad. Really sad. What's happening over there. But God is still in control. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for the support. And uh, whether it's financial, prayer, encouragement, biblical, teaching, uh, all of this without church there's no mission and without God's people there's no mission um, I'll start by saying back in 1975 Lebanon was at its peak as you've seen Lebanon was known to be the west was known to be the west uh, to the west as the Switzerland of the east and Beirut the Paris of the Middle East little did we know at the time that Lebanon was about to go into some really, really dark years to come. I was 14 at the time, a very happy 14-year-old, with many friends, uh, reckless ambitions, and excitements all around. Let's just say I was in my comfort zone. Suddenly, within a few months, everything changed. I remember while in class in Beirut, we started hearing machine gun fire in a distance. That went on for a few weeks. Some days, school let out early as the sounds of gunfire kept getting closer, closing in. Finally, one day, we, we were dismissed and never to come back. A civil conflict erupted. I remember sleeping in the hallway several nights with the folks while shelling and bullets were raining down on us. Actually, the bathroom was the most popular spot. <laughs> My mother, which is with us today, uh, had just given birth to my baby brother, Paul. And uh, the mama bear instinct was in full bloom. <laughs> Of course, with me one day showing up at the house with a couple of grenades and outfitted in a militia gear did not help ease mom's anxiety. So, needless to say, without vote or any democratic process, I found myself on a plane heading to the good old USA. I can only imagine how mom felt when the plane speeded down the runway at Beirut International Airport. I suspect she has a deep sigh. <laughs> Welcome, U.S. Fast forward another 20 years, high school, college, business, startup, marriage, two kids. I managed to, dr I managed to work very hard, but actually, uh, drove myself right into a ditch of life. But, as always God says, but only by his grace, God through Jesus said the buck stops here. The old things passed away 
and behold, new things have come. I was 35 years old. Fast forward another 20 years, Uncle Sam, which was a member here, and, uh, and uh, he started a mission a while back called MIBO, Middle East Bible Outreach. You just mentioned, Jim. He asked if I would serve on the board, and I did. And he also, uh, I, I did from 2015 through 2016. And then I was asked to be uh, an interim director while we lost our director. So that has been my, uh, my background as far as missions are concerned. Uh, now, as during my travel, uh, I felt a calling, a different calling. Uh, I felt call, uh, God calling right before the corona pandemics in November 2019 as I was visiting a small camp where two Western doctors, husband and wife, had started a, a Christian mission called Tahaddi Challenge in Arabic. And uh, they were, they were uh, reaching to the people called domes. Basically, they call them in Arabic, nawar, which is the closest thing we know here is gypsies. It's associated with a bad stigma. Anyways, there are some of the most, they are some of the most marginalized people and are considered the poorest of the poor, if you will. These people live below the radar of word relief they get no media exposure, unlike refugee status and uh, refugee uh, status, uh, persecuted people, uh, disaster areas. They are always getting media, and uh, it brings the relief agencies in. Uh, so, anyways, uh, long story short, we we started. Uh, uh, we applied for charity status uh, with the IRS November 11, 2019, and we got it. While Corona was raging 2020, the Lebanese Central Bank defaulted on the sovereign debt March 2020. First sovereign debt default in 77 years. The local currency lost 90% of its value, pushing more than 80% of the people in Lebanon below poverty levels. As if that was not enough, on August 4th, as you've seen on the on video, uh, an explosion at the port of Beirut, co they coined it Beirut Shima, destroyed one third of the capital city, leaving 200 people dead, many thousand injured, and about 35,000 families homeless. Today, uh, I called the outfit challenge, the mission challenge international because of the Hadith challenge in Arabic for that organization. So today, uh, today uh, challenge international and uh, international partners with, this, with the churches, a uh, couple churches in Lebanon, uh, 25 family provide basic needs, uh, food rations, medicine, heating and trans, uh, heating and trans transportation fuel, and many other essential supplies for their most basic needs. Uh, uh, some of these folks are actually uh, the church members. I mean, it's gotten to the point where just almost everybody in the country is suffering. They're church members, they're church visitors, the elderly, major physical illness, uh, really no source of income. So uh, we probably spend $50 to $100 a month per family just to keep them alive. Uh, I just will close by saying this is truly a, a homegrown mission. I don't want to claim it. Uh, he, God, started it. I'll just do whatever uh, this takes us. However, I'm only one member of this church. I would welcome anyone that God places on his heart to get involved. Several of our church members and elders
have encouraged me to push forward and not look back. If I claim zero reluctance, I would be lying. Sometimes I feel like Jonah. <laughs> I, I'd rather be on, in Cancun on the beach, but I'm, a, I'm, afraid that, I'm afraid that I might encounter God might bring up a big fish or something. No. <laughs> Thank you all, and uh, God bless you. Thank you for all the support. Thank you, Lee. God bless your brother. Um, if you are sitting in the middle aisle, would you pick up the attendance pad and pass it outwards so that folks can register their attendance with us today? Um, we have a number of announcements in our bulletin. I won't take the time to cover them, but please do look over them. And uh, with that, our Ukrainian relief fund, if, if you plan on giving to that, you can write a check and drop it out at the information desk. Just outside the doors here, but we will now receive God's tithes and our offerings. Lord, my weak thought in vain would collide Reach the starry vault profound. In vain would wing her flight sublime to find creation's utmost bound. But weaker yet that thought must prove. To search thy great eternal plan Thy sovereign counsels born of love Long ages ere the world began Be this my joy that evermore Thou rulest all things at thy Thy sovereign wisdom I adore And calmly, sweetly trust Thee still When my dim reason would be Thou dost ordain by some vast deep I seem to stand, whose secrets I must ask in vain. When doubts disturb my troubled breast, and all is dark as night to me. Here as on solid rock I rest That so it seemeth right to thee Be this my joy that evermore Thou rulest all things at thy will Thy sovereign wisdom I adore and calmly, sweetly trust thee still. Be this my joy that evermore thou rulest all things at thy will. Thy sovereign wisdom I adore. 
sweetly trust thee still. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your generosity toward us. And so now we seek to be generous back toward you. You have everything. You need nothing. But we are grateful. We are thankful. And so we give with open hands and cheerful hearts. So receive this offering and use it for your glory. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's turn this morning to 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 29 through 40. Thank you, Lee Ziotti, for your report. Thank you, Larry Warren, for your report last week. It's always a little risky to invite people down front to speak. You're never quite sure what, uh, what might uh, happen. I read of one preacher this week who... Uh, Pretty good sized congregation, and he was um, just preaching away about loving en enemies. And he said, uh, How many of you have forgiven your enemies? And everybody raised their hand, except for one man. His name was Walter Barnes. So the preacher decided to go where maybe he shouldn't have gone. He said, Mr. Barnes, he called him out by name, Mr. Barnes, are you not willing to forgive your enemies? Mr. Barnes said gruffly, publicly, I don't have any enemies. Preacher said, Mr. Barnes, that's very unusual. How old are you? He said, I'm 98. And the congregation burst into applause. And so the preacher sensed a wonderful opportunity to make a great spiritual point. <clears throat> he said, Mr. Barnes, would you be willing to come down here front and uh, tell us how a person can live 98 years and not have a single enemy? And Walter Barnes didn't hesitate. He rose out of his seat. It took him a while, but he made it down to the front, faced the congregation, said simply, bluntly, I've outlived all those idiots. <laughs> Actually, he didn't say idiots, but I cleaned it up a little bit for y'all this morning. <clears throat> Speaking of idiots, uh, Ahab was one such wicked idiot, and therefore the judgment of God was about to fall upon him. Father, thank you for your word. Give us uh, ears to hear, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So the king of Israel, beginning in verse 29, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your robes. And so the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. <clears throat> and when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is surely the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. 
Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until at evening he died. And the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot, and about sunset a cry went through the army, every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood. And the prostitutes washed themselves in it, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab, and all that he did, and the ivory house that he built, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his place. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, <clears throat> the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Ahab was the most wicked king in the history of Israel, and never was his wickedness more evident than when he murdered the righteous man Naboth and all of Naboth's sons in order to take possession of Naboth's cherished vineyard. Therefore God decreed that Ahab would die and Jezebel, his wife, would die and all 70 of Ahab's sons would also die. We learn some lessons here about unbelief. The first being that unbelief defies the word of God. Verse 29, <clears throat> so the king of Israel, that would be Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. Sounds pretty benign, doesn't it? Except that God had told them through the prophet Micaiah not to go. But Ahab defied the word of God. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, along with him, because you remember there were 400 other so-called prophets of the Lord that were really false prophets that said, go and fight and win. The Lord will surely give this into your hand. Ramoth Gilead had been taken by the Syrians and Ahab wanted it back. And he wanted it badly. But Micaiah, the only one, had prophesied in verse 23, the Lord has declared disaster for you. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end is what? Death. And that way is broad, and it has a wide gate, and there be many people that go through it. It's an easy way. It's not a troublesome way. It's a culture-friendly way. It's the way most people want to go. When R.C. Sproul was a, uh, a seminary student at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, there was one conservative professor by the name of John Gerstner who basically saved R.C.'s life. All the rest were liberal. And there was a student in R.C.'s class that was brilliant, most brilliant student in school. But unfortunately, he became a liberal student because he had all these liberal professors. And one day, R.C. asked him, why, why are you so liberal in your views? And he said simply, he said, look, R.C., there are all these professors with liberal views and only one who's committed to historic Orthodox Christianity. In other words, the most able student in the student body was determining truth by counting noses and that's the way so many people do it far more than we realize <clears throat> which way is the wind blowing <laughs> why is why is polling so popular in our country because it's an underlying tacit assumption that the majority must be right and therefore we need to know how most people are thinking It's a broad way, and it seems right, and it's easy to follow the crowd. Ahab did, 
Jehoshaphat did. The result was disaster. The German Reformed Church, back in the days of Hitler's reign of terror, essentially accommodated Hitler because it was the easier thing to do. Bonhoeffer stood virtually alone, not only against Hitler, but against his own church. Martin Luther stood alone against the emperor and all the leaders of the church with his life on the line at the Diet of Worms as he was pressured to recant all of his views. You remember what he said and why he didn't recant? Where did I put my glasses? I've got an extra pair here. <laughs> Thank you, Patty Giddens. See, it came in handy, Patty. These were Luther's famous words, unless I'm convinced of error by the testimony of Scripture or by manifest reasoning, I stand convinced by the Scriptures to which I have appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's Word. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. On this I take my stand. I can do no other. God help me. Unbelief defies the Word of God. Secondly, unbelief denies the providence of God. Verse 34, but a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. And therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. What do you think about that word random? You chuckle. It sounds so arbitrary, doesn't it? It sounds so uh, uh, accidental. And that's the way so many people think life is. It's just, it just happens. It just breaks out. Uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist, said, uh, said the whole universe is just spots and jumps without any, no, no unity, no uh, coherence, no continuity, no orderliness. It's just chaos. And I bet if you and I could have heard Ahab's friends talking, <clears throat> I bet they'd have said things like, what a bad break for the king. What, what bad luck. It's this certain man and this random shot and, and hit him in the Hit him of all places between the scale armor and the breastplate. That's just it's unbelievable that that sort of thing would happen. But believers know better. Believers know there's no such thing as random. That the Bible always loves to understate the providence of God. In the words of the old confession of faith, God the great creator doth uphold direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest to the least, right down to a certain man and a random shot and a vulnerable place. And the king of Israel was dead. Thank you, Travis, for what you sang a moment ago. Be this my joy that evermore thou rulest all things, all things at thy will. Thy sovereign wisdom I adore and calmly, sweetly trust thee still. The unbeliever says life's just chaos. The believer sees that invisible hand of God and knows he's at work in what the world considers random chaotic events in other words that God is sovereign over kings and queens and men and women and boys and girls and cultures and empires and churches and sparrows 
and lilies and hares and everything. That there aren't maverick molecules running around <laughs> loose, thank goodness, out there. So when the unbeliever says, oh, what a, what a horrible coincidence, the believer says, coincidence? That's just an event where God wishes to remain anonymous. And he does it a lot. When Joseph was sold into slavery, for example, <clears throat> God was anonymous. He didn't say anything, did he? But later we learned that while they meant it for evil, he meant it for good. He was there all along. Or when, uh, for example, when Pharaoh's daughter went to, went to bathe one day, a certain time of day, a certain place, a certain river, she just happened to see a basket, you know, in the reeds. God was anonymous. But he was at work for the good of his people. Or, you know, the story of Ruth. Ruth, uh, she just, just happened, I think is the word the Bible uses, she just happened to go work in the part of the field belonging to Boaz. And Boaz just happened to come along. She caught his eye. God was anonymous, but God was at work. Well, maybe the best example is Esther. For such a time as this, God exalted her. She won the beauty pageant and she became the queen and God used her to spare his people from annihilation. And God's not even mentioned in the book, the entire book. He's anonymous. Peter says that Jesus was betrayed and crucified, but it was all part of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God was at work through it all, and he's always at work. This is not randomness. This is not spots and jumps. This is unity. This is coherence. This is the hand of God working all things according to the counsel of his will. I don't know why God likes to remain anonymous, and frankly, I wish he didn't. Don't you? I think a lot more people would believe in him and trust him if you just take credit for some of these marvelous things he does. Even, even the wrath of man will praise God, the hymn writer says. Nothing happens outside the scope of his sovereignty, so we can and should say and sing that we calmly and sweetly trust him still because he rules all things at his will. Unbelief defies the Word of God, and unbelief denies the providence of God. And finally, unbelief receives the judgment of God. Verse 37, so the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Ahab tried his best. Did you know, notice that he disguised himself? He tried to outwit God. And one wonders about uh, Jehoshaphat. Did he have a screw loose? I mean, he went to battle wearing his robes. He went to battle looking like a king. And the king of Syria, verse 31, had told his, uh, his fighters to fight not with the small or the great, but only with the king. And so they went after Jehoshaphat until they realized that he was not the king of Israel. But you have to wonder about Jehoshaphat. And frankly, you have to wonder about Ahab. Why bother to disguise himself? Weren't those 400 prophets right? Did he have a little doubt? Was it possible that Micaiah might have been telling the truth, the truth he desperately did not want to hear? I mean, why bother to disguise yourself if you're going to put your faith and trust in 400 false prophets? G.K. Chesterton said, man's most universal experience is an uneasy conscience. <laughs> I guarantee you Ahab had one of those. So he thought he could outwit God. 
He desperately wanted Ramoth Gilead and he desperately wanted those 400 prophets to be right. But no matter how much someone plots and plans and dreams and schemes, we never outsmart Almighty God. Somebody may say, well, didn't Ahab repent? Didn't we hear about that a few weeks ago? Well, did he? What do you think? He put on sackcloth. He fasted. He went about dejectedly. But did he ever cry out to God for the forgiveness of his sins? Did he ever try to make amends to uh, Naboth's wife? For his evil, we've, we've got goofy ideas about repentance. His was worldly sorrow. There is such a thing. He was sad at the pronouncement of God's judgment upon him. But it wasn't godly sorrow. He didn't rend his heart. Maybe his garments. But not his heart. You know, we have, uh, we have different expressions in life that we use all the time. Some of them are biblical and some are not. Yesterday evening I was at a, a, a graduation party for a young <clears throat> man in our congregation. And uh, I sat next to a young boy, maybe 10 years old, who was about to, a nice meal was served. And this young boy was about to finish. And I said to him, uh, how'd, you get, uh, how'd you get your food so fast and eat so fast? And he smiled and said, I went through the line first. So I sensed an opportunity to make a spiritual point. I said, uh, <clears throat> well, you know what the Bible says about the first? And he just looked at me and I said, it says the first shall be and he didn't say anything. He just looked, you know. He just thought and could see the wheels turning. So I said it again. The first shall be. And all of a sudden his eyes got big and he said, the winner. <laughs> I said, talk to your dad. <laughs> but if I say a bird to hand is worth two in the bush, if I say there's no place like we all know those expressions. There's another one <clears throat> that's very appropriate as we uh, conclude this sermon this morning. And I'm going to tell you the story behind the expression. And then, uh, then we'll have a pop quiz. And you don't get to leave until you get it right. So once upon a time, true story, there was a great boxer. And he was world champion. And he held the title for 12 years. And his greatest challenge came from a man named Billy Kahn, C-O-N-N, I believe. And Billy Kahn was known for his speed, lightning fast, quick, nimble in the ring. And he could uh, land punches and then retreat quickly before his opponent could, could uh, retaliate. And uh, this match was, uh, people were at a fever pitch. It was the first televised boxing match in history. And for the first seven rounds, Billy Kahn did very well. But in the eighth round, he tired a bit. <clears throat> and the old champ landed a right uppercut and a left hook, and it was all over for Billy Kahn. That champion was Joe Lewis, and when Joe Lewis was interviewed before the match, he was asked how he planned on <clears throat> dealing with the speed and the quickness of Billy Kahn and Joe Lewis said uh oh <laughs> Joe Lewis said he can run but he cannot hide and so it was with Ahab he can run he can disguise himself 
He could, uh, he could somehow persuade Jehoshaphat to go out there looking like the king. But you can't hide from God. And against all of Ahab's efforts and all the efforts of all the unbelievers, dear friends, there's a stiff wind that blows from heaven. No one can fool God. No one can hide from God. No one can outwit God. No one who defies his word and denies his providence will ever escape his judgment. No one, in short, can beat God. He's undefeated. Always has been. Always will be. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> help us to learn these lessons that we may rend our hearts and not our garments. Spare us from false teaching. Spare us from false uh, prophets. Spare us from vain desires, O oh Lord. Grant that we would conform our lives to your word and not uh, seek in some way to conform your word to our lives and to our desires. We have all sinned and fallen short of your glory and acknowledge that we deserve nothing but your judgment. But we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has taken our judgment upon himself, who died for our sins and rose for our justification. We pray for the people of Lebanon uh, this morning. We pray that you would have mercy on them and uh, relieve them of their distress and uh, use their distress to effect a great spiritual awakening uh, in that land. Thank you for Lee and his ministry there. and Continue to bless uh, those people and continue to bless and preserve the people of the Ukraine. May they be converted, if they're not already, as well as the Russian people. May wrong fail and right prevail. May there be peace on earth for the spread of the gospel. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So what does it profit a man to gain a vineyard and forfeit his own soul? Not much. I suspect we all have our vineyards, don't we? The Bible tells us to set those things aside, set our affection on things above. The great missionary who was um, eventually martyred, Jim Elliott, said a man is no fool. He gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. We can't keep our vineyards, can we? But the Lord has secured an inheritance above that, that is reserved for us for all of eternity. So with the psalmist, we resolve again to, to take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. If you're here this morning and <clears throat> you've, you're not a believer, we welcome you and we encourage you to give heed to what's, what we've just heard and to the word of God, and to rend your hearts and not your garments. And put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be saved from your sins and join us at this table. Otherwise, whether of strong faith or little faith or new faith, we invite you to this table as, uh, to receive this um, visible means of an invisible grace. The night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterward, in like manner, he took the cup, and he said, Drink from this cup, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as we eat this living bread and we drink from the fountainhead, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
If there's anybody here, any of us, with an uneasy conscience this morning, the hymn writer says, let's shake off those guilty fears because the bleeding sacrifice in our behalf appears. First and last stanzas of our closing hymn, Arise, My Soul, Arise. And with confidence, let's uh, go out into the world and let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people say. <laughs>